Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Luke 7, verses 41 and 42. Two men were debtors to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay him, he forgave both of them. Which one then will love him more? Do you recognize that scripture from earlier in this year? No, if anybody would have got that, I would have just been shocked. That's how I started off this year's um, sermon series in Luke. And we're going to try to get through Luke 14 today. Luke 14, not a few verses, but Luke 14. So I promise you after the first hour, I'll let you stand up and stretch. And after the second hour, I'll let you take a potty break. No, I won't do that. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, I do thank you and praise you for your word, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Lord, that the glory of God shone through Jesus Christ and he lit a candle in the hearts of each and every one here that chose to believe that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of God, the Savior of the world, the chosen one, Emmanuel, God with, uh, with us. And that he is not only our Savior, but our Lord. So Lord, help us to devote our lives to serving the King of kings, Father, I'm just overwhelmed with the joy and privilege to be called a Christian and for the, the opportunity that I've had to shepherd and pastor this church. Lord, I say a special prayer for all the believers here because we are united with that of fellowship that only the, the body of believers know, that they have the joy in their hearts set before them because of Jesus Christ. They have peace that surpasses all understanding, a hope that is without doubt so, Lord, bind us together with your Spirit to be Christians in this world, to be like Christ. Help us to cast away those things that entangles us, as the author from Hebrews says, and any sins, Lord, that are a snare. Lord, I just pray that, that, that Satan and his demons are cast from this place so that we can bring you glory and honor in all that we do. Equip us through your Word, Lord. Help us to hear what the Spirit says to the churches today and not only be hearers but be doers as well. Lord, we just say, ask you to increase our faith and to, and to give us an intense fire of the Holy Spirit because Jesus tells us if we continue to ask you, Father, you will give us more and more of your Spirit. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that first sermon that I started this series in Luke was called At the Table with Jesus. And here we are at the table with Jesus again. We're going to be in the home of a Pharisee again. Jesus was invited to eat in Luke chapter 7 at a home of a Pharisee, and a woman came in, probably unannounced. We don't know exactly the details. You can you know, try to get more and more as you study Scripture, and the Spirit reveals it to you. But she came in to worship Jesus. That's the difference. Where the Pharisee just came, invited Jesus to see what was going on, to, but he's already got established in his mind and his heart who Jesus is, or his heart is hardened because he's heard the Word of God, but he's never applied it to his life. He's never let it, let it pierce his, his heart, let alone his, his, his soul. And this woman comes in, and she realizes she's come face to face with Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God's one and only Son. And she begins to weep bitterly to the point where tears are flowing out so much that they soak Jesus' feet. So she lets her hair down, which is an act of shame and anything. Who, who could ever do this before this honored teacher, Jesus, and dries his feet and then anoints his feet with perfume? And Jesus asked, asked those words to Simon because he knows the hypocrisies that in his heart, even though he's gone to church his whole life, we'll use that as our terminology here, and he studied God's word, he's an expert in it, he lives, and he lives zealously to serve the law, but doesn't know God personally. And he says, Jesus says, two men were debtors to a certain money lender, one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay him, he forgave both of them. Which of them then will love him more? 
Here we are at the table with Jesus again. Do you love him more today than you did yesterday? Do you? Because every day that you realize what God has done to, to, to you and for you through Jesus Christ, no matter the suffering or problems in your life or anything else, the more you should be madly in love with Jesus. It's all because of Jesus that you will spend an eternity forgiven of your sins in heaven. Wow. So where were you seated on January 7th, 2024? That's where we're at the table when the woman came in. Where were you seated in your life? As a pastor, as a shepherd, it is my job to shepherd your souls so that number one, you're saved, and number two, you're maturing in your Christian faith so that you can be like Christ in this world. That is the reason Luke wrote his gospel. So that you know what you believe, so that you will live it. If you're not closer to Jesus today than you were then, then please, before you leave this place, now if necessary, before this day ends, whatever it is, get right with God and thank Him for Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus would soon tell the woman at the table, your sins are forgiven. That is something He did not say to Simon. And He told her in verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Shalom, the whole thing that the Israelite nation was depending upon, that they would have peace one day. True peace. Their sins had been forgiven and they would spend an eternity with God forgiven. They didn't even have any idea that they would be called His child at this point. And you're called a child of God, a brother of Jesus, because what Jesus Christ has done for you. So here we are at the table again, my last sermon in the series of Luke. I hope you'll continue on. I hope you'll study. I do plan on doing, like I said, probably be a few weeks before we get established, maybe a month, whatever, before I start doing videos. But I do plan on doing Luke if you want to follow and go through that. There's also the book downstairs Teresa has with sermons. Do it on your own. Whatever you need to do. There's plenty of sermons online that you can do. Alistair Begg goes completely through Luke. Chuck Smith goes completely through Luke. There's no excuse that you don't continue on studying so that you're a disciple that knows what you believe so that you can live it. So here we are in Luke 14, chapter 1. One Sabbath, Jesus went to eat in the home of the leading Pharisee. And those in attendance were watching him closely. Right there before him was a man with dropsy. That's a condition that water is built up so there's a swelling. But it's a condition that's a sign of something much greater than swelling in your body. Your kidneys are failing. Your liver's failing. Your heart is failing. All these things which will cause death. It might on the outside just look like a problem of swelling, but inside it's a, it's a sign that you are dying. And anything that we see physically is to teach us spiritually. <clears throat> so Jesus asked the experts in the law and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then Jesus took hold of the man, healed him, and sent him on his way. Jesus reached out, grabbed the man securely, knowing that his, faith, his, his future was firmly secured in Jesus Christ. He healed him, and then he sent him on his way. And he asked him, which one of you, which, which of you whose son or ox falls into a pit on the Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they were unable to answer these questions. What hypocrisy we have so many times. We like to point fingers at other people, but look at the hypocrisy in your own life because if you don't, you're not doing that self-examination that we've already talked about in Luke's Gospel. It's so easy to see those things in other people, but what about in your own life? Do you examine yourself? As we're going to go on a little bit further, do you look into a mirror to see how you look like Christ? This man was a plant. He shouldn't have been there. This was on the Sabbath and the, the Pharisees brought him in. No, I don't know this from Scripture, but it's obvious if you read it again. I mean, it's obvious because he shouldn't have been there, not seated at a table across from Jesus. They put him there to see what Jesus would do so they could condemn him in their minds already because he was already condemned in their hearts. Notice how I said that and what sequence. They knew that Jesus was a man of God that he couldn't do the miracles that he did or everything else, but he wasn't going to be their Lord. 
because he wasn't what they expected. I want a Savior, but do I want to deny myself and take up my cross and follow after Jesus? I can't point to it today. <laughs> and as Luke's Gospel said, do I want to do that daily, take up my cross daily? I want a Savior that's going to bring me all the good things in this world. And as I said before, and I'll say again, and I'll say again, as I have the opportunity, even the disciples on the day that Jesus was departing said, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They, they had their sights focused on physical. When our eyes need to be fixed on Jesus and nothing else. It's not for you to know the times or seasons, but you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So are you that witness? Are you that light to the world? Do men see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven, or do they see hypocrisy? So Jesus sent him on his way, sending him out from the hypocrisy out into the world. Because in the church establishment, in the religious establishment was there, at the table there, there was hypocrisy. So Jesus healed him and sent him on and put it back to the Pharisees and all of the religious leaders there and said, which of you would not pull your ox out of the pit on the Sabbath day? But notice also here, Jesus says it's whose son, because that's the eternal consequences. If you're not a light in this world, then you're not a light to your children. And I ask you personally up here to pray for my children and my grandchildren, because that's one of the hardest things we're going to do when we leave. Just leave them 2,500 miles away. But we have total faith in God because we can't do anything anyway. And they will see our light, so I ask you to pray again that we find ministry down there to serve in together and effectively because we're not leaving ministry. There's no way we can leave ministry because we're called to be a light. I am so thankful for answering God's call to come to this church and then to serve where he called me to church. <clears throat> We're at the table with Jesus and we need to look at the spiritual condition of our heart because it has eternal consequences. So Jesus tells a parable after this. But before we go to the parable, before we go on and see, I've already made it through six verses. I'm moving faster than normal. <laughs> Just not going into as much detail. The risen Jesus in heaven wrote letters to churches that we see in Revelation. And if I ask you this question, you can say it out loud or you can not say it out loud. It doesn't matter. But if I ask you this question, if you think about those seven letters what would you think that they have in common? Something that Jesus himself said to the churches. I know your deeds. Seven physical churches. The Christian community representing the world of that day, 50 years, however long after Jesus has, has left this earth. And he doesn't say, I know your faith. I know your heart. I know you're saved. He says, I know your deeds. The first letter written to the church is from James. I know your deeds. Faith without deeds, without works, is dead. Cannot save you. There will be many that day that cry out and say, look at our deeds. But they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, depart from me. I don't know you. And we'll see that again in Luke in this chapter today. The evaluation when you look at your life is what does your life look like? I couldn't ask for any better sermon today for my last sermon here. What does your life look like in your deeds? Does it look more than like Jesus than it did January 7th when you were at the table seeing how the woman worshipped him? and didn't care about anybody else in the world. She just laid out worship to the God that was flesh dwelling among her. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Wow. No condemnation, nothing else. Just sent her away with the hope that she had in Christ Jesus alone. Not having understanding of anything else. I know your deeds. 
What does your life look like? Did you read this week's devotional? I've got to go back to that. Because see, when you say little things, Mark, when he said I hadn't said much about the devotional, again, it still rings in my mind. I've got to push that devotional. And you might see next week some devotionals lined up under here for next year. They haven't come in yet. Because I want to make sure that you're reading and studying what, whatever I can do to spur us to good deeds again is what the author says. <laughs> December 4th's devotional is entitled, Don't Kid Yourself. James 1 verse 16, Do not be deceived. You kid yourself, you might just deceive yourself. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, and uh, with whom there is no change or shifting shadow. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Why? That we would be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Are you? Are you producing fruit? Is that good fruit? Is it becoming more and more abundant, producing some 30, some 60, some 100, whatever the number is? My beloved brothers, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For man's anger does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and every expression of evil, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save your souls. Has the seed, the word, been planted? The farmer planted the seed, and we know that it falls on different kinds of soul, but those with a noble heart produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100, whatever the number is. What we do know for sure, and even a child knows, is if a farmer went out to plant seed, he expected it to produce a crop. Is that crop producing in your life? Can you let Jesus dig around for another year and be more effective and produce even more and grow more and more in love with the one who gave his life for you? Be doers of the word. There's the very next words. And not hearers only. Otherwise you are deceiving yourself. Second time we've got the word deceiving in there. For anyone who hears, hears the word but does not carry it out is like a man who looks in the face of a mirror, looks at his face in the mirror, and after observing himself goes away immediately and forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and continues to do so, not being a forgetful hearer but an effective doer, he will be blessed in what he does. He'll be in a right standing with God. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart and his religion is worthless. Where, where, where does the things come from on our tongue except what's on our mind and in our heart again? So if we're saying these things that aren't edifying to build up the body, we're saying these things that are, that are cutting and hurting and other things else, judgmental, non-forgiving, our heart is deceived because out of the heart is where the things flow from. And his religion is worthless. Many will say on that day, not a few, Lord, Lord. And he says, depart from me, I don't know you. The way is narrow and few find the path that leads to life. Make every effort, agonize over it, that you enter the narrow gate. Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Three times in that little section we saw to be careful. Don't kid yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Or you might find there weeping and gnashing of teeth in that day. Because you might have done mighty miracles in Jesus' name and everything else. You might have cast out demons, but you did not know Jesus Christ personally, and therefore your soul was not secure. You were not saved. You will spend an eternity apart from God, taking the wrath of your sins upon yourself, instead of letting Jesus take them upon his shoulders. Who would look in a mirror and forget what they look like? That's just stupid. You know what you look like. Now, i got a question for you. Why would you look in the mirror? 
If you looked in the mirror and said, hmm, I look good, well, then you're deceiving yourself again. You look in the mirror so you look presentable enough and make sure there's not blemishes you need to take care of, and then you change it. Oh, my hair doesn't look right. I've got a smudge right here. I miss this spot shaving. You look for the flaws so that you can go out and present yourself. When you look in a spiritual mirror, do you look at the flaws and lay them before the feet of Jesus so that you can look like Jesus, the image of Christ in this world? Have you ever thought about it that way? Do you look intently? Looking for anything? Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Let's let Jesus take care of this so that I look like Christ in this world. Or do you walk away and forget what you look like? Aren't you supposed to look like Christ? Who would walk away and forget what they look like? How ludicrous. The December 4th devotional was entitled, Don't Kid Yourself. I'm going to read a little bit from it. James is warning us here not to kid ourselves when it comes to the issues of the Bible, faith, believing, and behaving, because you've got to do if you believe. He has already warned against being deceived in general, James 1.16. Here, though, he makes it personal identifying a crucial area of jeopardy, the danger of being self-deceived. Let's see, Luke 9, 23, deny yourself. Live a life of self-denial so you're not self-deceived. Take up your cross daily. Face whatever it is to die to sin, to live for Jesus so that you can follow Jesus in this world. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Be like Jesus. To illustrate his point, James uses an amusing analogy. Imagine a person who looks into a mirror and then forgets what they look like. That's amusing. Who would do such a ludicrous thing? This word picture helps us understand our peril. If we have just put our own mismatched shoes, have smudges of dirt on our face, a mirror is useful not so we can congratulate ourselves, but in order that we can see our predicament and do what is necessary to fix it. Self-deception, in other words, can prevent us from seeing grave shortcomings that need to be addressed. The Bible is our mirror. Its purpose is, to congr is not to congratulate us, but to challenge us. When we look intently into it, we find out things we wouldn't know had we not looked there. But if we discover them and do nothing about them, we are self-deceived and remain in our predicament. If the Bible is going to be effective in our lives, we must learn to listen to it, receive it, and apply it. Treating God's Word properly does not mean merely reading it, understanding it, and agreeing with it. It means doing what it says. As you look into the mirror of God's Word today, tomorrow, and every day, notice what is reflected back to you. Then be careful. Do not walk away and kid yourself, but act on what you've seen, allowing the Bible to be the transforming Word in your life, as well as in all the lives that God calls you to touch, be a doer, not a self-deceiver. And then the next devotion was about reaping the harvest. Not to kid yourself that you have a part in the harvest. That the harvest is great, even though there are a few that find it, and the workers are few. Are you praying for workers to go out in the harvest? And are you especially pointing that prayer back to God use me in that field? So what do you see when you look in the spiritual mirror? That next devotion on December 5th, talked about so many sidestep or make excuses for that invitation to be a part of the harvest. And it was going over John chapter 4 and think about that. You know, Jesus hoofed it to get to that Samaritan woman knowing she'd be there in the middle of the day to avoid the crowd because of her sin and shame. He had to walk fast. Like those people you see like this, you know, walking to get there in time. He was tired and everything else, and his disciples saw the physical again. Aren't you hungry? Don't you need real water? But he went there for the spiritual to save her soul. And her testimony went back and simply said, I think I found the Christ. 
and brought so many other people to salvation when the disciples missed the harvest. Wow. Do you realize that there is a harvest out there that it involves your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, and even your enemies? What do you see when you look at the spiritual mirror? Do you simply look at it and say, I look okay, I look good, I'm all right, I'm saved? Or do you look intently into it to say, Lord, you know my heart. You know my shortcomings. You know that I love you, but the flesh is weak. You know that I have faith, but I need my faith increased. You know I struggle with this, whatever it is. Lord, give me more of your spirit to be like Jesus in this world. And God is faithful. Do you look at the mirror the next day and the next day to see the image of yourself looking more and more like Christ? Because that's our goal. That's what we want to be for all eternity. That's what we will be as a child of God. Don't walk away and deceive yourself. Are you a hearer and an obeyer? Do you love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength? And do you love others as yourself? Do you think of others as you think of yourself? I love myself. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a hard challenge to love others that way. Or do I sidestep that mission field? Do I walk away and forget what I look like? Do I take lightly that salvation of the one who gave himself for me? And then that passage of Scripture ends this way. After saying, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart and his religion is worthless. And boy, I could spend all day here in a sermon to the church for sure. But it says the next verse, pure and undefiled religion. If you want to see what real religion looks like, if you want to go into a church or a group of, chill, a group of Christians and not see the backstabbing and, and all these other things going on, what you will see is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Two things, to give out of a pure heart to those who are in need. Not judgmentally, not saying, let's, let's see here, check this list off first to see if you apply for our benevolence fund or whatever. It's to give out of a pure heart because you see them and have compassion upon them and you give because Christ Jesus gave for you and you're wholly set apart to be like Christ in this world because you're not polluted, you're not diluted, you're not salt that has been diluted. It's about being a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. So maybe we need to take another look into the spiritual mirror and ask God to show you imperfections you still haven't seen so that you can be more like Christ. If it was a job and you wanted to succeed in it, wouldn't you look for ways to improve yourself? And that's an earthly thing again. Why in the world wouldn't you look intently into the mirror, the Word of God, to examine yourself to see if you're like Christ and increasing in looking like Christ? Mirrors in those days were not like they were today. <clears throat> They didn't have that silver lining, get it? Because <laughs> we look so much at the things of this world and say, we're okay, we're fine, because we're in good shape, we've got health, we've got abundance. I think there's a letter to the church about that <laughs> in Revelation. I think Jesus says he's going to spit you out of his mouth because they don't realize, they haven't looked at the mirror intently enough to see how wretched and naked and pitiful and blind they are. We need to look into that mirror to see our imperfections, to say, forgive me, Lord, to buy salve for our eyes. So maybe we should take a look, a real hard look every single day into that spiritual mirror and then do something about it.
so that we don't deceive ourselves. Don't kid yourself, as the devotion says. Ephesians 3, verse 15, or verse 16. I ask that out of the riches of His glory He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. Why did Paul pray this for the church? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Then, you being rooted and grounded in love will have power together with all the saints to comprehend the length and the width and the height and the depth of the love of Christ and to know that this love surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Are you increasing in intensity of how you shine in this world to be like Christ? Now to him who is able to do immense, uh, immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is in work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's still the prayer for the church. If we're not growing to be like Christ, we're resisting God's power and God's plan for our life. As it was already recorded in Ephesians 2.10, we are God's masterpiece, His creation, His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus before time began to do the good works that He prepared for us to do. As your new shepherd comes in, I pray that you will let the Spirit shepherd you through the shepherd that is here to come alongside you, not to be just the, your guide. You've got to spend the time at home. You need to be in the st small study groups with your family, friends, whatever it is. You need to be constantly in prayer. Again, the bread of life you don't consume until you sit down and prepare it, take it in, and digest it just like you do real food. And if you don't, you will die physically if you don't do the spiritual, you will die spiritually. Back to Luke 14, verse, so I'll pick up with verse 6 again. They were unable to answer these questions. Why? They had the law in front of them, but they didn't have the personal knowledge. That their heart had not been pierced. They didn't look into the mirror, and they certainly didn't look intently. So Jesus spoke in parables, and we've already been told why that is, so that those who don't really see and really don't hear will always be that way. But those of you who can see, those mirrors, like I said, were a little dull then, but the more that you, after you understand what the real silver lining is, the more you can polish a mirror out so that reflection's a lot clearer. So Jesus tells them a parable. I'm in Luke 14, verse 7, and I'll go through kind of quickly if you want to follow me. As quick as I've gone through. <laughs> when Jesus noticed how the guests had chosen the places of honor, that tells me even more that this man was a plant because they placed him exactly where they were. Because if I was a more religious, stronger Pharisee, I had my seat closer to Jesus and then down the line because of who I am and my righteousness. <clears throat> When Jesus saw how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're invited into a wedding banquet, do not sit in the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited. Then the host who invited both of you will come and tell you, give this man your seat, and in humiliation you will have to take the last place, not just a lower seat because they've all been filled. So it makes sense to do it first, doesn't it? But instead, but the complete opposite, when you are invited, go and, go and sit in the last place so that your host will come over and tell you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in front of everyone at the table. For everyone who exalts himself <clears throat> will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So the first part of this is when you're invited. Have you ever been invited to, to a feast, a celebration? Well, how did you act? Without humility, Christ Jesus would have never came to this earth. I say that a lot because I ask people what the qualities of Jesus are. Love, love, love. Without humility, love may have driven the humility, 
But Christ Jesus would have never humbled himself and come as his very creation. I mean, that, that just doesn't make sense in our human mind, let alone humbled himself before us to take the cross and go there without speaking one word to justify himself. Then Jesus says to the man who had invited him, so he makes it personal again, when you host a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or brothers or relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they might invite you in return and you will be repaid. But when you do host a banquet, so we've gone from being invited to hosting and, and we've gone from a group uh, focus here to an individual, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Is that who you would invite? Think about it. Have you thrown a party or a celebration? Have you ever done that? <laughs> it's time to look in the mirror, isn't it? I mean, just from that statement alone. And if you do host a banquet and then you invite the crippled, the, the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, you will be blessed. Since they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now I'm going to add this again in, and I'm being judgmental of the church somewhat here, so forgive me for doing that. But not only do we not host banquets like that, but we like to pass judgment instead of doing banquets like that. <clears throat> if you listen and obey so that you reflect Jesus in the world... You will be exalted and repaid in heaven. Isn't that what it's saying? And I can give you so many more verses that back that up. But we're going to move on to verse 15. When one of those reclining with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is everyone who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. We've just moved it into eternal perspective. They did it themselves. Changed the conversation to that because the most important question we have is what's going to happen when I die? And if we have any compassion or caring, it should matter about what's going to happen to those we love, even our enemies. So how could we not be a light in this world? But Jesus replied, I'm going to give the quote from Alistair Begg's devotion, don't kid yourself. I mean, that's what he said. A certain man prepared a great banquet and invited many guests. You've been invited by God and everyone who has heard the message has been invited by God to be a part of this banquet for all eternity, celebrating where the wine never runs out, where your joy never fades, where peace doesn't go away whatsoever, where there's no sting of death, my friend. But when it was time for the banquet, which we don't know when the, the certain man's going to do that, do we? He sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. Well, we know that what that was from history. Jesus Christ came, his first advent. He, he came, as Scripture said, and he died for us, was buried, and rose again on the third day. But one after another, they all began to make excuses. So it directly points to Israel, but oh, let's look in the mirror first. Doesn't it point to me too and the excuses that I've made? The first one said, I bought a field and I need to go see it. Please excuse me. These are ludicrous reasons. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I married a wife and I cannot come. The servant returned and reported all this to the master. The owner of the house became furious, squelching in anger. And said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. The ones Jesus just said. So the servant replied, What you ordered has been done and there's still room. So the master told his servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. For I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will taste my banquet. Now the Pharisees, the religious sitting at the table who had put this man in there to see if Jesus would heal, they had no compassion or anything else for the least of these, the, the crippled and the blind, would not let this penetrate their heart. Because these words were directly at Israel, all of those who thought they were Israel. And he says the least of the ones in Israel, that's the ones who will really make it. 
And because you've rejected, the gospel message will go to the ends of the world. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord because they have accepted the faith in Jesus Christ, gave their life up because they know they're a new creation in Jesus Christ. They've been born again by the Spirit of God and they live for their King and exalt Him in their life. For I tell you, verse 24, not one of those men who were invited will taste my banquet unless you repent and show works of repentance, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Do you see Jesus Christ more and more when you look into the mirror? Verse 25, now large crowds. So here comes the invitation to the crowds. <clears throat> We're traveling with Jesus, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Cannot. I've said again, I'll say it again and again and again and again. Jesus says disciple. He does not use the word Christian. And after he uses the word disciple because you have forsaken all to follow him, you've come after him to fish for men and he makes you fishermen. You don't do yourself. It's all equipped by Jesus Christ. He is our being and everything else. You cannot be his disciple. And if you're not his disciple, you will stand outside of the door. You will not be invited to taste the banquet. Verse 27 and whoever does not carry his cross and follow me. Oh, we're brought back to that same Luke 9, 23 again. He cannot be my disciple. Which of you wishing to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost to see if he has resources to complete it? Otherwise, if he lays the foundation and is unable to finish the work, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this man could not finish what he started to build. Or what king on his way to war with another king will not sit down and consider whether he can engage with 10,000 men, the one coming against him with 20. And if he is unable, he will send a delegation while the other king is still far off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, whether you understand those things or not, you understand the cost and the battle, and you don't need to follow any more depth like that. All you need to have is childlike faith. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything, self-denial instead of self-deception, he, everything that he has cannot be my disciple. Now this passage gets so twisted and says we should hate people and everything else. No. When it comes to your love for God and what He's done through Jesus Christ, there should be nothing that compares. There is nothing that compares. No greater love does a man have than lay down his life for his friends. Are you his friend? Look very carefully into the mirror. Don't deceive yourself and walk away and not do anything about it. Salt is good, but if salt loses its savor... With what will it be seasoned? Nothing. It's a chemical bond. It's impossible. <laughs> you can't resalt salt. It is fit for neither the soil nor the manure pile. It has no purpose, none whatsoever. And it is, thought, it is thrown out. Now, understand this again. Salt in that day, just like I gave you a comparison of a mirror, salt was precious. It was costly. At some points of history, salt has been much more priceless than gold. It not only seasons. Think about that. Season gives more flavor. It's more. It's better. It also preserves. Well, we have refrigeration and everything, but they didn't. It preserved that so they could have food later meat, substance to live off of that was already flavored and tasteful and it purifies. Oh, how it purifies. And your works will be shown through the fire of what they really are. Your works, not your faith again. The works that were produced because of your faith. 
So when I look at a mirror, do I see where I am shaking salt so that I will flavor my life to look like Christ? To season those around me as well? Am I rubbing that salt all in? Whatever that looks like. Sometimes that's rough rubbing it in. Sometimes it's not. But am I making sure that it's getting all there so there's preservation? To my witness, to my testimony, knowing that that's empowered by the Spirit of God, that I will be His witness to the utter ends of the earth. And is my life being purified? Do others see it and is that happening in their lives? When I look into the mirror, do I see the image of Jesus Christ? And do I see that growing more and more each day? Verse 34, with salt is good, but if salt loses its savor, with what will it be seasoned? It is fit, verse 35, neither for the soil nor the manure pile and thrown out. Then there are, are a couple more words here, a few more words here. Oh, they're very similar to where we looked in Revelation again too. He who has ears, let him hear. If you hear the word of God today, do not walk away from it. I couldn't ask for Scripture to be any better on the last time that I get to be with you in person to tell you to look at that mirror, to examine your life, to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. The Spirit of God is here today. And I felt His presence when we were singing earlier strongly, comforted my soul. And He is speaking to you so that you will be like Christ in this world. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a wonderfully amazing, mighty God. A God who saves all who will call upon the name of Jesus Christ in faith. Lord, increase our faith. Give us wisdom to understand the mystery so that we can have the keys to the kingdom of heaven that we can give out to others that we can be salt and light to this world because we have Jesus Christ living in and through us as we read your word and as the Spirit sanctifies us to all truth. Oh God, I thank you for this church. I pray a blessing upon this church, each and every one that's here and those that will come into this body. And let this church know that I will always be united with them whether I'm in body, I will be with them in spirit. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.